Hello and welcome to Daily Interlake News Now. I'm your host, Taylor Inman. We're taking a look at some of last week's biggest headlines and what's coming up for the Flathead Valley. In this week's deep dive interview, I chat with Brendan Hickman, a thru-hiker who just beat the fastest known time record on the Continental Divide Trail. He tells us about his journey from Mexico to Canada, including his extreme hiking schedule that helped him beat the previous 2016 record by three and a half days. But first, here's some headlines. The integration of Logan Health and Billings Clinic was made official on Friday with Dr. Craig Lambrick leading the new healthcare system as chief executive officer. In an email sent to employees on September 1st, Lambrecht said the work of marrying the two organizations will take time. Starting this week, work groups from both organizations will begin mapping out integration strategies. There are separate work groups for people, patients, integration, finance, information technology, compliance, philanthropy, and education and research. Former Billings Clinic CEO Dr. Clint Seeger will be the chief physician executive of the new healthcare system, which remains without a formal name. The integration of Logan Health and Billings Clinic was announced in February. As of May, the two healthcare organizations had sent the necessary filings to the Federal Trade Commission. Lambrecht said in the email that employees and medical staff will benefit from the scale of the organization, which will create more opportunities long term through sharing best practices, advancing quality and safety, and quote, supporting initiatives that neither organization could support on its own. Brad Shipper, Chief Operating Officer for Logan Health, will serve in the same capacity with the new healthcare system. Ellen Layton, who served as Chief Legal Officer for Billings Clinic, will take on the role of Chief Administrative Officer. And Cole Turner, Chief Financial Officer of Logan Health, will continue on that role with the integrated organization. A National Park Service report shows approximately 2.9 million visitors to Glacier National Park spend an estimated $368 million in nearby communities. The peer-reviewed visitor spending analysis conducted by economists at the National Park Service said that spending supported nearly 6,000 jobs in the local area and had a cumulative benefit to the local economy of $548 million. Discover Kalispell Executive Director Diane Medler said visitation to the park is critical for many businesses who gear their operations to accommodate the rush of tourists. She said peak time for park visitation is very important for a variety of businesses throughout the valley. And when tourists are in town, nearly every kind of business can benefit. Medler said outside of the obvious businesses that visitors utilize, like restaurants and lodging, they might also need to get their car repaired or get their cell phone replaced. Whitefish Chamber of Commerce Executive Director Kevin Gartland said the park is the number one economic driver in the area. While the ski hills bring visitors in the wintertime, Glacier Park drives the tourism economy in the summer. The entire region saw a huge increase in visitation after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, and the Daily Interlake reported in May that local experts expected that trend to continue to slow down. But in a bustling diner or grocery store, businesses are still feeling the rush. Canyon Foods and Hungry Horse had a summer for the books, according to office manager and supervisor Annette Horn. Because in addition to the normal tourist boom, the store is servicing nearby fire camps, opening a little earlier for crews to stop by for a hot breakfast before heading off to fight fires in the Hungry Horse Reservoir. As one of the last grocery stores on the way toward Glacier National Park, the last few years have been a whirlwind for Canyon Foods. According to the report from the National Park Service, there was $23.9 billion spent by nearly 312 million park visitors in communities within 60 miles of a national park in 2022. The cumulative benefit to the U.S. economy was $50.3 billion. Highlander, an international long-distance hiking initiative, is coming to Kalispell at the end of September for its first ever event in Montana. Highlander is a Croatian backpacking company that organizes hikes of multiple lengths across the world and added the United States to its resume in 2022. The main event format in Kalispell is a five-day hike, about 60 miles in length, with four checkpoints. At each checkpoint, Highlander crew members organize various educational, entertaining group activities and presentations. There is also a shorter event format in Kalispell, a three-day hike covering around 30 miles. Highlander hosted its first event in 2017 in Croatia, and the group has experienced significant growth with each year. With hikes in Croatia, Georgia, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and closer to home, California and Kalispell, the group hopes to combine community with outdoor activity. Each Highlander trip requires a down payment, which in the case of Kalispell ranges from $359 to around $2,400, depending on the amount of spots purchased and the trek selected. The price includes cooked meals at certain checkpoints, backpacking food, a variety of drinks, and participant injury insurance. 
While participants must bring their own gear and camping supplies, the Highlander trip gives people the opportunity to take a long-distance hike without the stress of planning and safety concerns, according to representatives from the company. The event will host between 180 and 200 people. Participants hike at their own pace, guided by themselves, until they reach a checkpoint for the night. There, they will camp, eat, and attend presentations or events. Lake 5, near the gateway to Glacier National Park, could see new boating restrictions next year after a work group came to a consensus on Tuesday. After five hours of deliberation, the group landed on a recommendation that wake enhancements and wake surfing should be prohibited on the lake until July 1st. After that point, the last, wake enhancers and wake surfing are only allowed from noon to 6 p.m. Seven members of the 10-person advisory group supported the recommendation that will be presented to Montana Fish and Wildlife Commission for consideration. The work group was tasked with discussing recreational boating on Lake 5 after the commission received a petition in October 2022 to prohibit wake surfing and devices used to increase wake size throughout the year and to implement a no-wake restriction on the whole lake from April 1st to July 15th. The group compromised on July 1st, reserving the right for boaters to be on the lake during the July 4th holiday. The group's recent meeting was focused on data points and creating a recommendation. Kenny Breidinger, a fisheries biologist at the State Wildlife Agency, also shared data that revealed Lake 5's water quality has degraded over time, although he said that could be for multiple reasons like productive plankton or high wakes. Degradation of the lake was a common observation among attendees who were concerned about sludge and shoreline erosion. However, other members of the work group and public attendees disagreed with the notion. Public participant Doug Wild, who lives on the northeast part of the lake, countered that he has seen no evidence of negative effects from recreational activity on the lake. The Montana Fish and Wildlife Commission decided not to initiate rulemaking on the proposed restrictions listed in the petition at their February 22nd meeting, choosing rather to assign a local work group to discuss the issue and come up with a probable solution that represents multiple viewpoints. When the commission discusses the work group's recommendation, they will consider making the recommendation a rule, which if the rulemaking process is initiated, a public comment process would begin. For our last story today, I'll be reading from our most recent Law Roundup, a collection of calls to local law enforcement. A supposed dead body wrapped in a mattress pad found along the Stillwater River by a bike rider turned out to not be real when the Kalispell Police Department arrived. A very skittish dog was loose on Main Street. A person showed up to speak with someone regarding a male crawling around on their roof the previous night. Someone called dispatch with questions about opening a pet store that included aquatic animals and more. An officer said they would call them back in the morning. After witnessing a man throw a beer can out the window of his Honda Pilot, a caller followed the man in their personal vehicle. The caller was worried the man who was driving intoxicated was impersonating law enforcement. Dispatch took the man to the hospital when they arrived. A man was setting up camp and hanging his laundry in the bushes in a vacant lot next to the caller. The caller wanted the man to move along, and police told him to do so. In light of it being an ongoing issue, a caller reported that a horse keeps getting out in their area. Dispatch notified the owners of the horse, but noted that the horse itself was probably headed home already. An Australian shepherd dog was reunited with its owner after a caller picked it up. Someone was concerned that a log in the middle of the left lane on the bypass would cause an accident. The log was already moved out of the way when law enforcement arrived. Law enforcement gave advice to a juvenile's parents since they were not listening to them. An intoxicated male continued to fall asleep in the booth of a business until a police officer showed up and took him home. And someone was scammed out of $500 when they gave the scammer personal information. Read more of these stories at dailyinterlake.com. Brendan Hickman got his Triple Crown on August 29th when he reached the Canadian border on the Continental Divide Trail. He joined me in our podcast studio to share a little bit about how he prepared for the journey and how he managed to finish the trail in record time. So Brendan Hickman is a through hiker. He just completed his Triple Crown on the Continental Divide Trail, and he also got the fastest known time. He beat the fastest known time. So uh, while he's here in Kalispell, he's joining me here on the podcast. So thanks for being here, Brendan. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, so before we get into what life was like on the trail, could you tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I'm originally from Virginia, and about 11 years ago, I moved to Oregon, uh, where I've where I've been playing in the outdoors ever since. Uh, I am a social worker, so I work with um, children and families that are in need of support, and I've done that for about 15 years now. And then in all my spare time, I spend that hiking, camping, playing in the outdoors, and then uh, every couple of years doing an adventure like a through hike. So how did you get into through hiking? So uh, I've always spent a lot of time in the outdoors and a lot of time hiking. 
And um, I kind of uh, had, had read some books about, about through hiking uh, years ago. And I kind of was on a vacation with my family. We were telling, telling stories about adventures we had been on. And uh, I had been kind of thinking about the Appalachian Trail and kind of was like, well, what better way to like have amazing stories than to, to, to go out and spend a summer, a summer in the woods? Um, so it, it kind of came about from the enjoyment of telling stories. And I love nature and the ability to kind of go out and create a bunch of memories um, for a whole summer. So it kind of it, yeah, it came together out of the, the enjoying time with the family telling stories. Yeah. Um, so when you did the AT, mm-hmm. is that when you or tell me about the 100 day challenge that you sure. kind of like got into while you're doing the AT? So I started out the AT, which I was lucky enough to do with my dog, Sydney, who is an amazing adventure dog. Um, and somewhere along the process, I kind of, um, you know, I had, had researched a little bit about the AT, but there's many challenges along the way, um, a variety of challenges, uh, all kinds of interesting things. And so somebody mentioned uh, early on on the trail that there was a 100-day challenge. And so I asked more about this, and they said that the challenge is to complete the trail in under 100 days. And this, uh, this appealed to me. I'd already kind of started out the trail strong uh, with, with, with decent miles. And so I, th- I thought that kind of it was a good benchmark to look for, and that sort of helped push me. Uh, I'm naturally pretty competitive, but it pushed me to kind of push a little bit harder. Um, and my, uh, my dog was a, a champ and, um, and tolerated the miles uh, very, very well. She's very athletic. But, um, so, yeah, that kind of urged me to, to push and, and kind of maximize time on the trail hiking to try and get to this, this, this benchmark, which I was close to. Um, so what do you do to prepare for one of these big through hikes? This one was a lot. I've prepared for every through hike, uh, which, which usually consists of um, – you know, a lot of hiking and, and other items. But this one, I, you know, a couple months before it, I had decided, or actually probably six months before the trail, I had decided to go for the fastest known time. So um, it, it was actually a little bit difficult because about six months before the trail, it's too early to train. And I like overtrain if I start like really heavy. I already am very active. So I started, um, you know, about three or four months before the trail. And it, it consisted of um, lots, lots of hiking, uh, lots of hiking, walking, uh, weighted pack, uh, it, lots of, you know, n- not so fun stuff. Lots of stairmaster, uh, lots of strength training. It's just kind of anything you can imagine. A, a heavy, heavy dose of yoga. I'd had some some leg issues in the past that I was hoping to to avoid, and so um, essentially I started about three or four months before the trail and ramped up. So I, I ramped up to between twenty and thirty miles during weekdays of training, and any kind of like walking or hiking was weighted pack. I was carrying about a twenty pound pack. And then I was additionally doing stairmaster and, and strength training, and then on the weekends I would do um, thirty to thirty five mile hikes uh, in in um, in the beautiful wilderness of um, of Oregon. And so I think all these things kind of combined set me up really really well for this challenge. What are uh, the issues with overtraining? <laughs> so overtraining uh, essentially you can start you know having your your muscles break down, uh-huh. and so it's you can actually like start losing performance uh, and and your the more that you train, uh, especially at higher levels, the more you risk injury. And so I was really concerned that I like I could potentially, you know, risk doing risk having injuries prior to the trail or when I get on the trail. And as you go along the trail, you feel all those miles add up. And so what I didn't, you know, in, in an ideal world, I would have been able to train doing forty miles a day and get get one hundred percent prepped for doing the training. But I was worried that that forty miles a day would cause damage. And that I would essentially start my my process of kind of um, diminishing my performance or increasing my risk of injury sooner. So that's why I like started slow and I ramped up. And then at my maximum, I was still below what I would do on the trail. But I was, you know, what I felt as prepared for it. Um, but it's definitely a risk of, especially with the variety of things I was doing. And I was still doing strength training. And I had days where I would be doing strength training and I would like get to a point and I'm like, okay, I feel a little bit off, let me stop. Let me make sure I don't have any risk of injury because that would have been yeah, pretty disappointing to like not even get started and have an injury. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Or if you got out there and you had an injury, I mean, mm-hmm. um, correct me if I'm wrong, the CDT has its own sets of challenges where, I mean, there's just not as many people mm-hmm. um, that you would pass along the trail like on the PCT. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, high exposure up at elevation and all that jazz. Certainly. And it's a, it's a very rugged trail. So, you know, um, especially as I got kind of into the point where I felt really secure in being able to, to meet the goal that I had, I was really 
cognizant of not stepping the wrong direction, not stepping on the wrong side of a rock. You know, that, that injury could take me out. And the, and the, rail, the trail is so rugged that the, the, there's a great possibility that you could step in, like, and injure yourself or fall, which I did many times. Um, <laughs> and so I was very careful about that. Um, and I think early on in the trail, I was definitely, like, also careful. But it's so early that, you know, you don't think about it as much. When you get closer to that goal, you're like, you can really visualize it. And then you're like, I, I don't want to do anything to jeopardize this. Um, but it is, it's a very rugged trail, and there's not that many people out there. So it's, it's, it's a very unique experience. When you were on the trail, what did you do from other hikers who were just hiking the CDT normally to try to, like, be fast, be quick? Absolutely. This is a great question. So the thing that I did was spend as much time as possible hiking. And so it's, you know, it's it maybe not always as fun, but I would get up really early and I would hike really late. So um, I typically would get up, uh, I would wake up between 4.30 and 5 a.m. And I would be on the trail between 5 and 5.30 a.m., and then I would hike to between 10 and 11 p.m., which is a, is a really long day. So I think that extra time hiking is a huge difference. So I would minimize time off of my feet. And I think that that's 100% the key. The, the speed at which you hike makes a difference, but I don't think it's as significant unless you're a very, very fast hiker or a very slow hiker. Um, and I'm generally a very fast hiker, but um, once you get 20, 30 days in, it's not quite as fast anymore. So, um, you know, I think that the time on your feet, so I would, I would get up really early, start hiking, I'd hike when it's still dark, um, hike, and then I would take minimal breaks throughout the day. So I'll typically take about three breaks during the day. They were typically between 15 and 30 minutes each. And so I would take breaks to kind of do, do um, sort of meals. Um, so I would eat around uh, 10 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and then I would do dinner at 7 and then continue to hike on until between 10 and 11. And I think that minimizing those breaks and maximizing time. And then the other area kind of revolving on the same discussion, is that you stop in towns along the way. And towns, especially when you're on the trail, you're hungry, um, you're exhausted, they really kind of suck you in and you really want to like go there and relax and eat a lot. And so that's a common thing where, where a lot of hikers um, maximize their time in town and they like, they'll spend the night, they may, they may take what's called a zero day and they'll take a full day to recover. Um, and that's something that I think is amazingly helpful in terms of speed is not doing that. So I never stayed in a town. I would essentially go in, get resupply, and then get right back out on the trail and hike. Um, and so I, you know, if I would have arrived at a town late, it's possible that if I, you know, would have gotten in at like 9 p.m., that would have potentially stayed, but it just never worked out that way. So I camped every night. And as the trail went on, I would, I got better and better about minimizing time in, in the towns. So in the beginning, I had days where I was like five or six hours was like my town day, but from getting off trail to getting back on trail, and towards the end in, in Montana, I got really good at it. And I had many times where it was two hours. And it really maximizes the amount of time you're able to hike. Wow. So what kind of challenges did you encounter on the trail? <laughs> so there's a variety of challenges. And I think that kind of the main one with the CDT is that it isn't fully complete. It is, it's, it's, um, it's not as maintained. It's beautiful, but it's not as maintained as the PCT, as the Pacific Crest Trail or the Appalachian Trail. So there's... Um, you know, there's times where the trail is is really rugged and rocky and you're walking on essentially like cantaloupe-sized rocks that cover the entire trail. There's times where there is no trail and, you, and you're like walking through a really rough field or you're walking through a, a lava field, which was one of the roughest days. So I think that the ruggedness of the trail, it goes through really wild mountains that have, you know, really intense inclines, uh, really high elevation. In Colorado, it's like, you know, 11 to 13,000 feet pretty much the entire state, which is pretty significant for, uh, for the amount of oxygen in the air. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, New Mexico was really fascinating because there's free range cattle everywhere. And so a lot of the cattle use the trail and they also like divide off of the trail. So you'll be in a place and it's like a web of trails and you don't, there's no marking. So you like don't know which trail is which. So sometimes you're on like what you think is the trail and then like 10 minutes later, you look and there's a sign like, you know, 50 feet to the side of you. And you're like, oh, so I'm just beside it. So you have to like adjust. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the marking of the trail and the ruggedness of the trail uh, are, are very challenging. And then with especially Colorado, the altitude, and this was a significant snow year. So there was, there was a fair amount of snow when I got to the San Juan Mountains in, in Colorado. And that very much hampered 
um, you know, forward progress. And the, the guidebooks I'd looked at had said that typically by July 1st, there wasn't much snow. So I didn't go into it with, um, you know, an ice axe or micro spikes. And so there was a couple of dicey parts there that caused a, a little bit of extra time trying to navigate through, you know, maybe risky snow or ice areas. Yeah, I was going to ask, were there any kind of like weather events that gave you some concern that might have like impacted how quickly you could finish the trail? So I was really lucky with weather. I, I think that for the first significant period of time, I'd say like probably the first 40 days or so, I didn't really face any any really challenging weather. There was very, you know, there weren't really much in the way of rainstorms. Uh, the temperatures were very nice. Around when I got to to Wyoming, that changed a bit, and it got a little bit more challenging, and there was a lot more rain. And so I had a, a specific day where um, I had been kind of wet from the day before, and oftentimes when it rains, especially if it, it rains in the evening and then it doesn't get sunny, or if, you know, if it rains in the morning and it gets sunny, most things dry. But in a lot of the areas, there's a significant amount of brush, and it'll hold the water. So if it rains in the evening, you're oftentimes wet when you go to sleep, you're wet when you stop. And then in the morning, all the bushes hold all that water. So you get soaked in the morning. And sometimes, depending on the bushes, you know, it can be anywhere from mid-thigh to, you know, your shoulders. So I had a, um, a couple rough days through Wyoming. But specifically, um, I had a time where I had gotten wet from rain. And I had set up camp in a very, very less than desirable location because there just wasn't camping spots available, uh, which is another interesting topic about the CDT. But um, so I had set up camp, like, in the trail, and there's like brush on either side of the trail. So I'm already at risk of getting wet from this brush. And I, I set up and I put my tarp, um, just spread it over myself. I didn't set up a tent. Um, and it, it sprinkled overnight and it, a bunch of the water gathered in my, in my tarp. And when I moved at like 4 a.m., it, it poured onto my sleeping pad. And so I woke up at 4 a.m. to like being very wet and was just like, oh gosh. So I just, I went ahead and packed up and started for the day. I was like, I'm already wet. I'm already uncomfortable. Like I'm not going to go back to sleep. And it rained all day. And this was, you know, a day that I went into Yellowstone. And so it rained and there was really, really tall brush that all got wet. And so I started out in the morning with like my, my like puffy jacket on, my like insulated jacket. And I went through some brush and it got soaked. So then like my most insulating layer is wet. And, and you know, my sleeping bag's already wet from the morning. Everything I have is basically wet. And I had like... 36 miles to the next road and so essentially I had to like full speed all day to stay warm um, and this area of the trail had like 10 or 15 river crossings where I had to wade through them and so sometimes they're knee level sometimes they're waist level and um, and then I'm walking through lots of wet brush it was raining um, you know I, I ironically took a picture of myself entering Yellowstone and I'm like smiling and you can't see anything through the photo because it's all wet and I was like, I need to, you know, like put, put that on the wall to remind myself of this experience and that I was not actually really smiling for most of that day. Uh, but, but what was tricky about that is that luckily I was able to, you know, get to a road and I had to rush really, really hard to get to the road at a decent hour so I could get a ride into, into a town. Um, but it would have been much more concerning if I wouldn't have been able to get a ride because everything is wet. And then I'm, I'm running a little bit more of a risk of, of hypothermia. Um, you know, luckily most of what I have insulates when it's wet, but it's, it's still concerning. Um, but I think that was my biggest weather. I, there's, you know, Colorado is pretty famous in the summertime for, for lightning storms that on the peaks. And I was really lucky that um, there was a lot of storms on peaks around me, but not on where I was. And I know lightning can strike a you know, pretty long ways away from the actual storm. But um, I, I didn't have a lot of moments where I felt really in risk of, of lightning storms. Um, I was really well equipped, despite not having micro spikes or an ice axe, I was pretty well equipped um, with with other gear to, to feel safe in Colorado in the nighttime when it would get down to freezing. Um, and so, you know, weather wasn't a significant issue. It was just uncomfortable when you're wet all day long or your feet are wet for like up to five days at a time. It's, it's, it's tricky and it's just not, not fun in the morning to get dressed and put on wet clothes and wet shoes. Um, so it was more of a discomfort and less of a risky factor. And then the... the the National Forest Service and the National Park Service and um, uh, the, the CDT organization really do a great job with forest fires in rerouting you around them. So I was never really at any risk of forest fires. They do a great job of identifying them and then creating a reroute to adjust around that location so that you're not at risk. So luckily it was 
it felt other than that one really rainy day in Yellowstone, it it um, it felt relatively safe weather wise. You meet a lot of people on the trail and you see a mm-hmm. lot of cool things. What were some of your favorite moments? There's there's so many. I think that you know, I, ironically, one of my favorite moments is the people. And I think that you know, as a through hiker, you you especially on the CDT, you very much rely on people to be able to get into town. So so you know, on a lot of the towns there you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 miles away from the trail. And your options are to walk that and back. So if it's 30 miles, you're walking 60 miles. Or or you hitchhike into town. So you, you're not, you know, hitchhiking any of the trail, but you're hitchhiking from the trail to town and then back to the trail. And so, you know, I think it's kind of amazing the the kindness of people and that people are willing to, you know, to pick up people. And, and there there is a culture around it, but it's just people are so kind. And so I think that that's, you know, ironically, it's not really the trail. It's like part of the experience around the trail. But it's so nice to like have people that are willing to to help people out. And some people that would go out of their way and they say like, I'm not going there, but I'll take you. And, you know, that's that's really valuable. And, and along the way, you meet people and they're, you know, everybody's really kind of, uh, or, or a lot of people you meet along the way are really curious about the trail and ask a lot of questions. And then oftentimes they'll dig through their pack and they'll offer you almonds or like whatever snacks they have. And it's just so kind that people are willing and some people will give you the snacks that they're intending to eat so i'm always like wait i don't want to take anything that you know that 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 you're that you're needing or or wanting um and so i think that's that's really it's it's really refreshing and then i think that i had this really extreme case and and i I can't remember the name of the store um but when i was in 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 silver city i um i I was trying to get new shoes my feet were hurting me a lot and i was trying to get new shoes so i I specifically like went into the city and then i had to like walk um, a mile or so to this this sporting goods store and i checked the time they closed and everything and i got there and they had closed abnormally early because they went to like a memorial service and um and i need to do a huge shout out to this organization i need to i need to find the name of it but um so i then somebody was very nice and they gave me a ride across town to another sporting goods store and they didn't have anything that was adequate for for shoes um the, you know this so i i basically was like all right well i guess i'm stuck with what i have so i i got my resupply i went to a grocery store got food and i went to a restaurant and then i left the restaurant and i went out to hitchhike back to where the trail is um right at the edge of town and i have a nice little sign that says cdt hiker um, you know, heading the trail, which is helps a lot. But uh, so very quickly, um, this really nice woman pulled over and and gave me a ride to the trail. And along the way, I'm telling her the story and I'm saying like, oh, I actually came, you know, one of the things I wanted in town was shoes. And I went to the store and she's like, they're family friends of mine. And she starts making calls and they agree to open the store for me. So that this person like drove me to the store they, the, like one of the, the, I'm assuming owners or managers, like met us there, opened the store up, allowed me to try on shoes and purchase them. And then the woman like drove me back to the trail. And I'm like, this is like, ama- I've, you know, like this is amazing. It's such like kindness and resourcefulness and being willing. And not only was she willing to like reach out to her, you know, family, friends, the person was willing to come open the store for me and take time out of their day after they've been at a memorial service. Um, so I think those things like are, are really valuable Um, you know, I think that, you know, the, the, the question was like, you know, about favorite moments on the trail. I think, you know, that's its own kind of category. And then I think just being on the trail, being out in the wilderness is really rewarding, carrying everything you need on your back and knowing that you can kind of go wherever you want. I mean, obviously I'm doing the trail, but you know, like having everything you need is really great. And, and, um, as I got further in the trail and I got more secure in accomplishing the goal, I, I stopped doing things like drinking cold coffee in the morning and I actually would like make warm coffee. And, you know, sometimes I would wait until sunrise. I would like start hiking and then I would stop at sunrise and make coffee and drink it watching the sunrise. And that's just such a neat experience to be out there doing that. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's so many beautiful things about, about through hiking and the, and being in wilderness and the people that you interact with that there's, there's so much that could be discussed, but yeah, it's all just, you know, aside from, um, you know, being tired, hungry, and getting blisters. It's its its a beautiful experience. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, because I'm just, I'm always curious about mm-hmm. through hikers, what they eat. What did you eat while you were out there? A huge variety of things. When I'm hiking, um, I went through a lot of things. So my original plan, because I mailed out, I believe, 13 resupply packages to myself before I started the trail. And I had this idea that I was going to 
not really stop for breaks. And I was going to eat granola bars and, you know, a variety of different granola bars as I hiked. Um, and that's not really a great, for me, that's not a great game plan. I, it's not as satisfying and same granola bars for the whole trail is not that great. Um, but so, so for meals, um, I mailed probably half or two thirds of my meals and I did a variety of, of, um, grains, grain or pasta meals that were pre-made and I added in some nutrition. So I added in like, um, you know, freeze dried vegetables, freeze dried beans, um, uh, like seasonings. Sometimes I put in like freeze dried cheese, depending on what it was. I mailed myself some like um, some some nicer ramen than what you get along the trail, um, and um, and then of course lots of granola bars. You know, oatmeal for mornings, um, and you know some 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 candy and trail mix and stuff like that. Um, candy in terms of like candy bars, and so then along the trail I resupplied. So I probably did maybe half packages and then half resupply at grocery stores or sometimes gas stations. And at gas stations, it's, you know, kind of the go-tos for through hikers, very, very common foods. And so a lot of that would be, you know, like your typical ramen, um, your nor rice sides, which are like, you know, really easy rice dishes. And then I would supplement them with, um, with cheese. You'd be surprised how long cheese will last in a backpack, even in the desert. Um, I'd supplement with like cheddar cheese. And I would also use um, a fair amount of like tuna, um, like packets of tuna really helps um, add, add the protein. And then, you know, meals during the day when I was through hiking, or sorry, when I was resupplying on, um, on the trail, the, a wide variety of things. So um, kind of a go-to is tortillas with peanut butter and jelly. So I did, I did a bit of that. And then I, um, I experimented with um, ham, cheese, packets of mayonnaise, like making sandwiches out there. I didn't want to go too long with like ham or turkey in the pack. I wanted to be a little bit careful about how long I did that. Um, I, I think I pushed it out to like a, a pretty far into two days. Um, and... Um, I, I packed out uh, a whole bunch of like hot dogs at one point, and that was like for a very short period of time. Um, but I think that was kind of the main, you know, my main meals were um, lots of granola bars, trail mix, and then, um, you know, tortilla or bagels with um, with ham or turkey or and cheese or uh, ham and cream cheese, which also does surprisingly well. And then, um, yeah, a variety of kind of other things. And then I... I I actually found that candy bars were quite helpful. I'm I'm a pretty I'm a pretty nutritious eater, and so it's it, it pains me to tell you all of these things that I was eating on the trail because they're not things I would normally eat. But I felt that like um, candy bars actually helped a lot with energy, and so it's like and it didn't seem to burn out quickly. Um, so I, I ate a fair amount of candy bars. It kind of expanded or it increased as as the trail went on. Um, but I, yeah, I think that's a, a little bit of the variety of things I ate along the way. And of course, when I went out to towns. You know, I was eating a lot of, um, you know, hamburgers and burritos, and and um, on two separate occasions, I ate an entire half gallon of ice cream in one sitting after <laughs> dinner, um, and um, yeah, lots lots of stuff like like that. Town town meals were very nice. Yeah, wow, what a variety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes when I when I see people uh, people do things for like performance, like athletic fe feats like that, that you just don't really um, take the time to eat is a variety of foods like that. That's mm -hmm. cool. When it's very surprising, you would think for like, you know, a high level, a thing where I'm exerting a lot that I would need to focus a lot more on like nutrition. And, um, you know, one of it is access, access to nutrition. I can't really, you know, pack out a bunch of vegetables. It, it's, it's really difficult. Um, so it, you kind of have to go with what's, what's available. And it really did seem like it was way more calorie focused, like calories, um, and a little bit of like, you know, your various like nutrient breakdowns, but, um, it was a lot more like calorie focus and I, I went after the things that like made me feel good and ironically it was that list that I just provided to you <laughs> um so what was the moment like when you realized you were gonna beat the fastest known time mm. so when I was in Wyoming in the Wind River Ridge which is a pretty beautiful wilderness area I I was pushing really hard and I got sick and so I, I did kind of a short day, and then I ended up doing my first ever zero, sick in the backcountry, um, slept all day. And, and then the next day, I, I hiked and, and did another short mileage day. And I, I was really concerned about the ability to hit the fastest known time. And so I was, you know, I cranked up um, the miles to try and overcome the, the, the downtime. And I had been using um, 
the, the total mileage of 3,050, which I had read in one of the various guidebooks. There's a lot of variety of what people say the distance of the trail is. And so I've been using this number of 3,050, and I'd been doing my math based on this number. And a little bit later in Wyoming, when I was, when I was near Yellowstone, I, I had, and I can't remember how it came about, but I had this realization that, that I thought that actually the number based on what I, like the, the app that I was using wasn't 3,050. And so I confirmed that the, the number was 29,000, uh, sorry, 29,000, 2,974. And, and with the miles that I was doing, I was perfectly on target to beat the, the record by days. So I had this really interesting swing from being very concerned about being able to hit the record to realizing that like the math I was using wasn't the accurate math based on the, the total number. And aside from something going wrong, I was right on target to be able to hit, hit the goal. And so it, it was a, a real instant change, an instant swing of the pendulum. Um, and so basically, yeah, right, right near Wyoming and Montana border, I, I became very confident that I was going to be able to hit the target. And, um, and, and in spite of that, I sped up and, and did additional miles just to make sure that I was going to be there. And it was a very big shift in mentality and, and, and helped, helped a lot. It's very far, hard to find motivation when you're concerned about being able to be where you're supposed to be. Yeah, what a good time to find out, like right um, towards the finish line, really, yes. in like the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, you you spend so much time training for something like this, and then you take the months off to actually do it. Mm-hmm. With it kind of in your rear view now, um, what what are you kind of thinking? Like, what did you get out of, of doing all this? I think that, you know, there's a wealth of memories. I have a lot of pleasant memories, and even, even the tough times, you know, there's – they're, they're still, in a way, pleasant memories, these, these things that I've gone through. So I think that the experience has, has provided a lot of really amazing memories that I can look back on. And then the sense of accomplishment. And I think the accomplishment hasn't quite settled in yet. Um, I, I kind of, you know, in adjusting back to civilization, I'm distracted by everything else. And I keep kind of forgetting that the two things, like, number one, I've completed the Triple Crown. And then number two, um, you know, I, I beat the record, um, uh, the, the fastest known time. And so I think that, um, you know, that's something that I'm looking forward to is more of that realization. But I think there, there is that there. That sense of accomplishment is, like, is really, really big. And I think that the trail is so interesting and it creates so many stories that it's a really good, you know, topic to discuss. And it's just really fun to, to, um, to talk with folks about it. And so I look forward to using this experience to talk more, to raise awareness about the trails and, um, and kind of, like, yeah, maybe, maybe help help uh, increase some funding for the trail so they can get, get things done they need to. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, do you have your eyes set on anything else? Any new challenges that you want to take on after this? Great question. I think that, you know, these challenges require a little bit of a readjustment period, and and you go through so much, so much and recovery can take a little bit of time that sometimes you focus on recovery and you're like, I don't want to talk about challenges until, you know, until a later date. But I do... You know, I definitely want to continue to do challenges like this. They're really fun. They're really rewarding. Um, a, a couple things that I have my eye on as possibilities is I would definitely like to bike across the U.S. I've always wanted to do that, see the, see the U.S. from a bicycle, um, and and we'll see how, you know, I'm not sure I can compete with those in, in, incredible athletes that have done that in record time, but uh, we'll see how, how competitive I want to get and, or versus how, how leisurely. And then also I've looked at the possibility of um, – of, of canoeing rivers from, from kind of source to, to end. And, um, you know, I, I was inspired by a, a gentleman I met on the uh, Appalachian Trail years ago, a guy named Graybeard, that set the record for the oldest person to um, both um, canoe the entire Mississippi and to do the, the Appalachian Trail at 82 years old, or at least for the Appalachian Trail, he was 82 years old. And he talked about this, and I was like, that sounds amazing. And you have, you know, you have to go through, like, locks in the river and stuff. Um, sounds like a really neat experience. So there's a variety of rivers that might be really fun to paddle the entire river. But yeah, there's so much beautiful nature. There's so many amazing things that are out there. You know, I, I, um, I definitely will continue to hike a lot. And um, I'm also looking at the possibility of doing adventures that are not hiking and, and kind of shifting around and seeing what else is out there to have different experiences. But I will certainly be spending a lot of time on trails as well. All right. Well, congratulations, Brendan. This is a huge feat. Um, and thanks so much for stopping by to tell me a little bit about it. Of course. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. See Brendan's time record on the fastest known time website under the route for the Continental Divide Trail. Mm-hmm. 
Let's take a look at what events are coming up. Remember, you can find karaoke nights, art classes, live music, and anything community related by going to dailyinterlake.com slash events and exploring our events calendar. And for businesses and event organizers out there, it is totally free to sign up and start posting your events for the whole region to see. Trigo Heritage Day starts today at 1 p.m. and runs through Sunday. The TFS Community Hall founded Trigo Heritage Days to bring together members of Lincoln County communities to celebrate their deep roots in ranching, agriculture, and logging in the Tobacco Valley. The Friends of the Big Fork Fire Department are holding their 17th annual fundraiser. Join this weekend for tennis, golf, and pickleball tournaments, followed by their famous barbecue. Find out more information at BigForkFD.com. And Imagine If Libraries are holding another Anime at Dusk on Saturday at 4 p.m., their fandom group will be showing Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. Parents are encouraged to attend as chaperones for their teens. Please remember all chaperones must complete a waiver at the entrance. For teens in grades 6 through 12 and registered chaperones only. Thanks for joining us. News Now is a podcast from the Daily Interlake. We're proud to be the largest independent newsroom in Montana and the oldest paper in the Valley. Consider becoming a subscriber to support our work. Call circulation at 406-755-7018 or go to the subscribe tab in the top right corner of our website. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel to never miss an episode of the pod. Everybody stay safe and have a great week.